this week on the Back Table Podcast. That's why it's hard to like talk about negotiating as like a broad scale. Certain skills are, you know, valuable, tactical empathy, understanding the perspective of the other side. Don't set the anchor, avoid compromise because usually people aren't happy if they're each giving up something. That's fine in politics, but not when we're negotiating our careers. Label an ID, their negative emotions, watch your tone of voice and ask questions to kind of make it their problem. I mean, those are useful things, but ultimately at the end of the day, everybody does have something that's important to them. I have friends who are my age. They're working 80 hours a week. They're taking call all the time. They love it. They love their job. That's great. That's just not everybody. If that is important to you, right, know what's your value, what's important to you, but then make sure you're getting in return from your counterpart the value that is deserved for that type of work ethic or, you know, whatever your specific interest or need is. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Back Table ENT podcast. We're a podcast that focuses on all things otolaryngology, and we've got a really great show for you today. Thanks for stopping by. My name is Gopi Shaw. I'm a pediatric ENT, and I'm here today with my lovely, brilliant co-host, Dr. Ashley Agan. How are you today, Ash? Good morning, Gopi. I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm excited for our guest and our topic today. Yeah, absolutely. Let me introduce. Today we have Dr. Mark Royer, an otolaryngologist practicing at Family ENT Specialists in Evansville, Indiana. He is the medical director of entlocums.com, the largest provider of ENT locum tenens surgeons in the country. His wife, Dr. Allison Royer, a previous guest on the Back Table ENT show, is the founder of entlocums.com and his otolaryngology practice partner. And Mark is here today to talk to us about how to negotiate your salary. Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. I really appreciate it. Gopi, it's great to see you as well. It's great to see you too. I actually think this whole, the premise of this whole podcast was a negotiation tactic for Gopi because she's been working with us now in our Locums company for almost a year. year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's been a great experience. I've gotten to work with ENT Surgery Solutions with you guys and After having Allison on episode 57 on ENT locums opportunities, I got an introduction to you guys and also made me curious, a little bit more curious about locums opportunities. And so it was perfect. It's been awesome. I've gotten to work with entlocums.com with you guys and your team for a little bit over a year now. And it's been a great experience. It's been a great clinical opportunity. It's been great to travel a little bit and keep my skills up and It's been awesome. It's been a lot of fun. And the reason I will say now this is turning a little bit into a testimonial. However, I would tell you the main reason, the main reason, because there's lots of companies and people to choose from that you can work with. But I just trusted you guys. Like you guys are familiar to me. I trusted you guys. I feel like as ENTs, as other physicians, y'all get it. Y'all know what the needs are. And I felt like, okay, if there's anybody that's going to help me kind of protect myself and my interests, it's going to be you guys. So it's been a great experience. It's been a great opportunity for me. Well, thank you so much for those kind words. We certainly have loved having you work with us as well. And I hope that was an unpaid testimonial because I don't think I can afford <laughs> no, no. the value There's in been hearing no from you talking about that. There's been no <laughs> transaction, full disclosure, no transaction for that <laughs> testimonial. <laughs> so yeah, when you reached out to us about potentially working, I think in the same conversation, you're like, you know, I'm just terrible at negotiation. Actually, would you come on and do a podcast on negotiation? And then when we actually, you know, when we started setting up a date and then that, I had to cancel that unfortunately and I just I really was dragging my feet to set up another time because I started to have some self-doubt because I had this one site in particular that I was negotiating with and I was doing all of the items that I was going to talk about as kind of my keys to success it wasn't working and it was like going down and so I was just like I don't I shouldn't be on this like this isn't like I don't have nothing to add and sure enough the day that we decided to set it up they got back to me and took the offer and so here we go. <laughs> Give it a go. Hopefully we can provide some value. You're like, I do know a thing or two about this. <laughs> <laughs> Not much, but at least a little bit, a little bit to make that deal land. But it's one of those things where when you are negotiating as much as we are in our business, I think about it, it's really easy to get tunnel vision and think, oh, negotiation is just salary or just call or just this one item. The reality is we're negotiating every single day in tens to hundreds of ways, right? Like last night I was negotiating with my daughter about what time she's going to go to bed? Are we going to read like how many chapters of Percy Jackson are we going to read, <laughs> right? With, you know, the alley, where are we going to go for lunch? Like in micro ways all the time we're negotiating. And I think we think of it as this big, scary thing where we have this really important meeting with a hospital administrator. But when it comes down to it, we're, we're doing this all the time. Yeah, for sure. But before we get into it, we always like our guests to be able to tell us a little bit about themselves. 
So tell us about you. Where are you from? What's your practice like? Tell us about entlocums.com and how that became and where you guys are now. Sure. Well, I went to IU Indiana University for residency. I graduated around 2012. Allie was a resident with me. She graduated a couple of years later. And when she got out of residency, we took hospital employed jobs doing general ENT. And that was a really great experience. We started a practice for the community. We were able to operate together a lot. I mean, it was just like kind of, it was really our dream job. And that was my first kind of foray into really actually negotiating a contract. And I felt a lot of pressure, right? It was like the both of us, it was our first job. And so we really worked together to hash that out and had a really good experience, I think, as a result of that. And I also learned a lot like from that whole process. One thing, not to jump too far ahead, but I would encourage anyone who, when they're in those early negotiations, if they see any red flags or things that kind of stand out to move on, realize don't, don't ignore those if those are coming up. And we had a couple of different places that we were considering. And one, for example, we were pretty much the exact same ENTs on paper. And they offered me a salary that was like 50,000 more than Allie. And I mean, as being huge women in other ecology advocates, you know, even back then, it's it was like, wait a second, this is and impressing them on it. And they weren't getting any reason for that. I'm like, OK, well, this is not a good situation, right? We have to have go to sites and value us for the surgeons that we are. And that ended up being a great decision for, for a number of reasons. So not ignoring those red flags, I think, is really important up front. While we were at that first employed job, I started working on my MBA. And we had a number of factors come through. We had two amazing daughters. And when our youngest daughter was born, we were having issues with childcare and our nanny got married and moved away. So we moved down to be where Allie's from, her hometown of Evansville, Indiana. And having that MBA, I felt pretty confident to start our practice. And the other thing we started doing was she had started a company known as ENT Surgery Solutions a few years before, and we really kind of dove into helping that grow. And so she had started that and was running that. And we really then had some time to get it off the ground. And that's where we started helping kind of what we needed. So when we were employed in practice, it was just the two of us. We were pretty much covering call 24 seven. And whenever we, we have an international travel problem. So whenever we wanted to head out of the country or have, you know, have a baby, like who's going to cover your patients, who's going to cover your ER. And so that's when we first learned about locums and really thought that that was a service that a lot of ENTs would be needing because a lot of the independent groups of four or five are being bought out by hospitals and then would have through matriculation or whatever, maybe two or three. And so they're on call Q3, Q2, and that's really not sustainable for the long term, especially when you're grinding it out trying to generate RVUs. So we thought there would be a huge ability to provide that service. And we were right. I mean, and part of it was just empowering docs to realize, hey, you should be expected that your lifestyle is something a little bit more reasonable than than being on call every other weekend or every third weekend. So once we kind of had that up and going at the same time, we were also doing our family ENT specialist, which is our practice, our general ENT practice that we've opened. And we still have that. Although as our locums company has grown, that's taken a lot of our time, both administratively, but also clinically. We're in multiple states, but in the states that we're around, we will help out. We recently had a site. It was like a whole service line site. We had one doctor had have shoulder surgery. Another one was on maternity leave. So we'll fill in and, and help out at those locations. So we keep our Evansville practice open. Mostly I say for friends and family because, you know, you're going to have the teacher's kids that need ear tubes and we have such a backlog of care in the community. So we try to at least, you know, provide help with some of that at the same time. But we've really enjoyed too, especially more lately. Yeah, I turned 40 last year, so I'm really trying to kind of have a different stage in the career where we're really now also focusing while growing that at our community involvement. And so we're really involved in the kids' school. Allie's on the board of trustees at our kids' school. I just was appointed last year to the board of health and chair of that for our community. So we're really spending a lot more time growing the company, working clinically a little bit, and then you know really trying to improve things for our area. You guys are such a power couple. I love it. Friggin' love it. So awesome. It's amazing. I love the community involvement that you each have because as physicians, I think we get so caught up in our practices and our clinical practice that we forget that we have a broader impact. There's a lot of translatable skills and, you know, public health needs that we can contribute to, whether it's through education or in the public health sector. So that's really awesome. Congratulations to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. And especially as like physicians, right? Especially when you're in an area where there aren't a lot of physicians, like it really is, I think, valued input. So I encourage anyone who has that ability to, you know, the time, that's the hardest part, right, is the time. But I think if you can get in there, your kind of knowledge base and skills as a physician are are greatly appreciated when you have the time to give back. Otherwise, it's just realtors kind of running the politics. No offense to realtors, but a lot of realtors in local government committees. 
<laughs> so let's negotiate the salary. When you come at this, let's talk about some important things to consider. How do you think about it? Yeah, you know, so one thing I want to say as far as negotiating salaries, there is a podcast that Backtable has done that is just outstanding with Michael Johnson. He's an attorney. And so for the real nitty gritty, when I heard that, I was just like, wow, this is truly the best getting into from a lawyer standpoint salary. So I encourage everybody, I don't know what episode that is, but Michael Johnson, he actually did a two-parter that was just outstanding. So great podcast, really gets into the nitty gritty and kind of more the legal aspects. What I have to provide is like that grizzled head and neck surgeon perspective, right? Compare that to your like, everybody from residency has the facial plastic doc that is you know, taking 10 hours to refine a nasal tip or the neurotologist who can just do a beautiful temporal bone dissection. Well, my negotiating kind of skills that I can provide are like that, the head and neck surgeon who's just like trying to plug the carotid blowout or, you know, has been doing a laryngectomy in Ghana or whatever. So like, that's kind of my perspective in how I approach things. And, you know, the other thing I want to say is like, when you're negotiating, and especially as a new grad, or someone coming into this for the first time, really try to dial back the pressure you're putting on yourself because statistics would say you're not going to be at that job in five years. And I think we talk to so many docs all the time through the locums company and often get like this air when they're talking to me of like they're a little embarrassed or a little ashamed that their job that they started two years ago isn't working out. Like, is there something they could have done better or something? And I'd really try to reassure them that this is extremely common. I mean, this is especially with our younger kind of younger generations, healthcare has changed so much. No longer can you really join a practice for 30 years and you know have everybody, it all be rainbows and butterflies. It's just not like that anymore. So I think the really important thing is to don't give yourself too much pressure up front. Just kind of take the approach that, hey, it's probably not going to work out. And then also give yourself an option to make sure you have plenty of plan Bs and, and know what else might be available. I think there's an immense amount of pressure on residents graduating out of residency to land the perfect, you know, job. If you think about it, we're always constantly trying to land, right? You're trying to land into medical school, into a residency, into a fellowship. And so there is this sort of unrealistic idea or ideal of, okay, it's going to be perfection afterwards. I've worked so hard and, you know, there's this life waiting for me. And the life is now. I mean, <laughs> it's, 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 right. It's, it's, it's right now, whether it's in your residency and fellowship in 10 years out by it's right now. It, it's the process. So that expectation is tough. We do put a lot on ourselves to make it perfect. And I think to that point, it's being honest with yourself is what do you truly value? I mean, are you in our role to use us specifically? We really wanted to not miss important things with our kids. And more than that, we wanted to give them like we wanted to take them with us when we went to Asia or Europe or wherever. I mean, we wanted to spend a lot of time with them and really kind of not be typical surgeon parents as they're growing up. Because I mean, I remember how many times that you would hear, oh, they just grew up, you just elementary school's gone in a blink, you know, then, then they're in college, right? And I, we didn't want that. We wanted to err on the side of probably too much parent time. And so that was a value to us. And so then that kind of plays into when I'm talking to especially younger doctors, what to look for when they're negotiating their salary and specific terms. Really call is, I think, an important thing that often gets overlooked or pushed aside by the counterpart to the physician's negotiation. Because one thing you'll hear a lot is, and I just had a phone call with someone lately, just yesterday, and it's like, oh, call's not that bad. Oh, it's really, it's not busy, right? It's not a big deal. Well, that's different than you're not actually on call, right? And so the thing about ENT is oftentimes our call will be undervalued by hospital administrators because they see orthos call burden and specifically the number of times they're coming into the ER, they'll see general surgery. And we don't have that in ENT. But the problem is we, when we're on call, we have to be within 30 to 45 minutes of the hospital. When we're on call, there's always that potential to be pulled away from our kids' birthday parties, which happened to us when we were even just the you know, four years that we were in the hospital employee job three times, right? And for a, like a level three hospital. And we're just leaving in the middle of the big birthday party that has everybody there. And so it's call is a burden. And then you have like life-threatening things, right? Even if you're not covering an ER, you have tonsil bleeds that you have to deal with. So I think call is one of the, I think, single biggest issues that I see as a disconnect between what hospital administrators value and what our kind of, I'd say, millennial and Gen Z docs coming up value and kind of understand as an issue. Because it's not just okay to say, hey, I'm I'm on call, but it's not that busy, right? You're still getting calls in the middle of the night. You're still then having to you know do a full clinic day the, the next day. And we also are competing then with our amazing senior colleagues who really just ground it out. I mean, for years, for decades, they would be on call all the time. They didn't, they didn't care. Like, at least they didn't complain about it, right? And so that's 
depending on every site's different, but sometimes I'll get into a hospital system where they, I mean, I don't even think appreciate the amazing like senior doctors that they have. These guys who have just like not been complaining, they've just been doing it. They've been coming in whenever, wherever their entire life is their practice in their hospital. And if that's you, that's great. Like I wish I had that, you know, ability to get derive that much pleasure and satisfaction from just my job, but I don't. We enjoy our kind of hanging out with our colleagues and spending time with our family and doing these other things. So you know, I think call is something to be very aware of when you're negotiating. And then the other ENT specific item is work RVUs. And all of the discussion I hear in work RVUs is related to the number. Oh, how much are you getting per work RV? Are you getting 50? Are you getting 70? Are you, you like, and with ENTs, we have such a unique specialty that what's way more important than that number is how they're calculating it. And by that, I mean is we have unique situation that our ear tubes are bilateral, right? It's pretty rare we just do one ear tube. When we're doing kids, we're doing bilateral. A lot of our sinus cases are bilateral. A lot of our cases, sinus or otherwise, are multiple procedure codes. And the way they calculate that, how much credit they give if you're doing bilateral multiple procedures can make it, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars of difference over what someone's expecting to be paid with their bonus versus what they're actually made. It's really important to have those conversations and make sure you find the person who's actually calculating it. I just recently, last week, was talking to a doctor and I dug into them kind of more as a favor. They were like a friend and they were like, I asked to speak to the person that manages that and kind of calculates that. And that was very hard to find. And even that person didn't really understand it. And when I actually looked at it, I realized they were never getting any credit. I'm not talking about they were getting reduced credit for bilateral. They would do a bilateral ear tube. They would just get paid for one ear tube. They would do a bilateral maxillary antrostomy. They were just getting paid for the one, right? And I was like, what's going on? I was like, oh, there's no, in our computer system, there's no place to put the modifier and no way to give credit for that, right? So for three years, he's just been getting like half credit for all of this stuff. So I think RVUs and ENT are really important. Not only like, how are you getting credit for bilaterals? How are you getting credit for multiple reductions? Because if you're making 55 versus 65, that difference is going to go away very quickly if you are not getting credit for half of what you're doing. So those are kind of the things that I'm looking at considering and how you want to negotiate your salary in specific terms related to our field that I really encourage ENTs to pay attention to. But before you go into vacation, so there's not a standard across hospitals on no. how to calculate the work RVUs? There is not a standard across hospitals. It is as variable as just about anything in medicine. I have been really shocked to see that. And I think it's so hard to understand. People can understand, oh, there's so much work credit for this procedure. But what gets really complicated is even like general surgery, they're just doing like one cholecystectomy. I mean, it's not like they rarely do they have multiple they're not doing bilateral cholecystectomies, right? They're not doing, you rarely are doing multiple procedures. But with us, our bread and butter is going to be, you know, we'll either be doing like ear tubes, which is a bilateral case, or we'll be doing tubes and tonsils, which is a multiple procedure and a bilateral. And so it's very rare that there's consistency in how it's documented and recorded. And there's even like debate, like I used to kind of be really hardcore, hey, you have to give full credit for this, right? As a surgeon, I'm doing the same work. That's what we're getting reimbursed for. We're doing ear two ear tubes as one ear tube. I mean, it's the same procedure. I just moved my chair over. But I think that debate has pretty much been won by the people that say, oh, we're getting a 50% reduction for bilaterals. So that's going to be reflected in the RVUs. It's not true everywhere. But what's really concerning to me is that I'm seeing more and more sites, docs that are like, I, this isn't making sense. And I think it's because they're, they're just not even paying attention to the bilateral side. Depending on your practice can really make a huge difference. So just making sure that that, and the place that when you're talking to them and negotiating with them, they actually understand. They can actually have this, the person that they at least give you enough respect as a potential physician to find you the person who can answer those questions to your satisfaction, I think is really important. So in terms of uh, negotiables, we've talked about call and work RVUs. Is vacation time as much of a negotiable? Yeah, totally. I, I kind of chalk that up to like call, like as part of the under the call thing, because if you're on call all the time, you're not gonna be able to take any vacation. Actually, before we kind of worked it out, I was on call on Christmas Day. I was charged paid time off because I didn't have to come into the hospital. So I think vacation time and negotiating that is very important. I think if you can figure out the call component of that, then you know, most of the time, the paid time off, for, and we're talking specifically employee jobs, right? Because if you're gone, you're not generating RBUs. So I think it comes down to if you want more vacation time, try to not make that as some of the capital that you're burning. Because ultimately, once you're off that guarantee, if you're gone half the year, you're going to be generating half the RBUs. So they shouldn't give you a pushback or deduct, assuming your, you know, your call is covered, or your partners are okay with it or whatever. Call how the work RBUs are calculated. 
vacation time I think is is important. I really encourage docs to not focus on low rent issues like for example CME, right? That's usually pretty standard. I don't want to burn a ton of like time negotiating, oh am I going to get 6000 versus 4000 for CME? I mean that's really kind of a small thing in the big scheme of things. If you know if that's really important to you or how that's used I really encourage docs to kind of focus on those bigger things. So if time off is important, then what that requires is, okay, making sure, let's say you want to take 12 weeks off a year, like a lot of our anesthesia colleagues do. Okay, well, make sure we have it in that contract, who's covering the call, right? So they're not saying, oh, you're not on ER call, but you know, well, who's covering my patients, right? Depending on the situation. So that the ER call and practice calls managed and to make sure that your RVUs are being calculated fairly and at an appropriate number so that you're not taking a huge hit in that year you come off your guarantee and you're gone 12 weeks throughout the year. Moving on to talking about salary. When I think back to when I was kind of negotiating and stepping into my first job, trying to figure out what's an appropriate number for salary is really tough, especially because you have, you know, you get these flyers in the mail and you get these text messages and emails about like, you know, move to Arizona and you're going to make seven figures, you know, blah, 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 all these, you know, lucrative promises. And you're like, oh, well, is that what's, you know, normal? Is that the standard? And then you might have other smaller practices that are offering maybe a smaller salary at the gate, but long-term potential for more growth. So it's it's very overwhelming to try to be like, hmm, like, where's the right number to start with? How do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So to quickly answer the question, I view a ballpark these days as like 300K for academics, 500K for private practice, right? Should be within those ranges somewhere. And this may be dated by the time this podcast comes out and people may be thinking you're crazy. But I think generally just from understanding the market, I think that's generally the right now. I mean, and that obviously that, you know, depending on where you move, the geography, that can vary widely if you're in a really cool place versus, you know, an even awesomer place like Evansville, Indiana, like that can vary dramatically. But that's a general ballpark. The issue we run into with salaries, especially in employed positions, is something called the Star Clause. And Michael Johnson talks about this quite a bit in the in the podcast. But it's the idea that a hospital, when you're employed, they can't pay you so much. There's a certain number limit to how much they can pay you. They have to pay you what fair market value would be for your work that you're doing. Because the idea is, well, if they're paying you too much, what they're really doing is buying referrals from you. And that's a kickback, right? And so if you try to go to most any hospital and try to demand seven figures up front, that's going to, usually that's what you're going to hear. Well, first of all, they're going to think you're kind of an asshole. And then, so you may even just kill your negotiations there. But secondly, they're, they're ultimately going to say, and, and quite frankly, they're right. Well, we have fair market value rules we have to follow. And so that's where I think it's really important to you know understand you shouldn't be like well underpaid under those numbers. But if you're around that and it's kind of a starting salary, that's great. The second thing is, I always encourage docs to try to take more upfront rather than a promise of more in the future. And that was true even when our prime rate was like at 1%. And now we have such a higher interest rate that that time value of money is, is worth even more than it was five years ago. So I always encourage docs to take the higher guarantee upfront, take the higher sign-on bonus, make sure that you know how it's being repaid so it's not repaid over 10 years, right? But like as much as you can get in those first two years, is really important. So I would, that's that's usually what I try to negotiate. They're like, oh, you know, you're going to make 200K this year and then you're going to be making X much more if you just wait around for two or three years. I think the only times where that really applies is like, I know a few of the guys in the big ENT group out there. That's probably the only time where it's like an appropriate approach to take where you have a group that is well-respected and well-known in our field, run by ENTs. You know, you're going to have the partners, you can see the track record. But if you're kind of going to a hospital and it's an employed position, and they don't really have much experience with long-term ENT service lines, I would be very wary to take a position that's promising more in the future than they are up front. So I always encourage docs to do that. Try and really focus on, hey, if you're going to err, err on the side of a higher starting salary, you have to be within those ranges. Otherwise, they do have whistleblower lawsuits and stuff like crazy stuff like that that can happen. And then with regards to fair market value, I always have been getting the word out, and this has allowed our company to grow and our, I think our docs to really find more happiness and fulfillment in their career. Whenever you're negotiating and someone says fair market value to you, I always 100% agree, but then say, well, we also want, you know, I agree with you on the fair market value compensation, but that does require fair market value quality of life. So this idea that if you're going to pay me this, what you're saying is fair market value rate, well, then I should probably be taking fair market value call, not be on call. Q2 or Q1 or Q3, right? And so that's a great way because 
a hospital could technically have you never on call and pay you around those ranges. And it would be very difficult for them to have a fair market value violation. So kind of thinking, what, what do you really want out of your career and your time there working? If it's a better quality of life, if it's more vacation time, like that's a great way to take an employed job because they do manage the overhead. You don't have that overhead burden, but really kind of trying to just take some time and figure out what is important and then figuring out, understanding a little bit what the, you know, the other side of the table, their limitations are. Usually it is salary. That's the kind of the main thing. They can't show this really high salary. And Gopi, I know we had corresponded before you were asking what includes compensation or salary. It's everything. They include your sign-on bonus, your CME, if there's any like forgiveness of loans, your guaranteed salary. They throw that all in there, quality bonuses. So when they're doing these fair market value calculations, they look at all of that. One thing though that I've not seen them include in that as an actual monetary number, at least not yet, is call. Like how are they, to put it in there if they're paying you for call, but if you don't want to be paid for, if you'd rather just take less call and rather than, you know, make a high amount of call or just get a piddly sum, which usually was what happens, then, you know, that, that doesn't make it in there. So that's kind of a great way to approach, I think, negotiations, depending on what your values are. Can you take the same sort of perspective or way in which you negotiate salary when you're trying to join a private group or potentially doing locums as you would for a hospital employed position? Is it similar ideas and strategy and kind of thinking, or do you have to work it differently? Yeah, that's a great question because I think it's completely different. I think talking earlier about like, and I probably shouldn't talk about them too much because I don't know them very well, but I just know they have a high reputation. The large ENT group out in New York, a group that has such a long-term track record is ENT run. I mean, in a smaller size, we in Indiana, we used to have a lot more independent groups. Now they've a lot largely been acquired by hospitals, but definitely have to approach those differently because those practices don't have unlimited or really deep hospital system pockets. They don't have, you know, they, there is a lot more collegiality there. The partners that are there are the ones making the day-to-day decisions. So when I've gone down that road or had discussions with them, I really try to defer a little bit more, partially because I own a private practice, right? I understand the challenges and limits there, but also the potential upside that you can have if you join a ENT private practice group that's been in operation for 30, 40, 50 years, has surgery centers, has ancillaries, has solid patient reviews, has a good primary care. Like a lot of times where they will not be able to offer a high salary up front. So really what's more important in those situations, granted, I have less experience negotiating those, but the times that I have, it really comes down to, okay, well, when can I become a partner? How much will it cost to become a partner? How are we allocating overhead in the short term? You know, what if I don't even hit my salary that first year, right? Is that then being deducted in the following year? So I think it's a lot more, I think it has to be a little bit, it's a different take than when you're dealing with hospitals because you have less autonomy. The trade-off for that is they have deeper pockets. You know, they're paying for the overhead. They're paying for your call coverage if you're your locums expenses. So, and they're paying you this higher guaranteed salary. So I think you have a little bit more leeway in those situations and you can approach it a little bit more as a shark, I think, than I would personally, and this is just personal opinion, than I would when I'm interacting with you know, these colleagues I respect and admire who I know have been really doing a great job in, in their private practice that they've grown and run independent of a hospital. And then locums is, yeah, a completely different ballgame, right? Like locums, generally, it is a short-term position and not all the time. And we have a number of docs who have worked for us for years. I do think what's nice about locums is if you, and this isn't our company, of course, everybody comes and works with us, wants to stay with us. (laughs) They love our job. They love our site. I love, I'm having a great experience. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't apply to our company, but you know, the other locums companies, if you get into a situation, you don't like it, like you don't have to come back. There's no long-term, usually there's no long, there shouldn't be a long-term commitment, right? Oftentimes these jobs are put together without even a physician involved. So you'll have a recruiter at a big company and a, an administrator who decides they want ENT and you get there, there's no equipment or the, you know, the patient load is like way too high. There's no one there to cover your patients when you leave. So like every once in a while I hear horror stories of somebody's worked somewhere else and they, they make their way to us. And it's, so it's different. It's like you're, there's a lot more uncertainty in what you're getting into. That's so why I think you have a little bit of a premium on what you're getting paid, like on a daily rate. It's a short term position. That's another kind of approach where, you know, you're not negotiating. You don't have to think, okay, what is this going to be like two years from now? Or three years from now, am I going to be a partner? It's, I think it makes it, it simplifies it in a lot of ways because you can be like, okay, I have these three weeks over the next six months. Here's what it's worth for me to be able to come out there. You don't have to, and oftentimes you don't have to worry about, I mean, we don't do any work RBU kind of payment. We just do it. You know, we, we try to treat our docs like they're lawyers, essentially, like they have hourly rates. What is it worth for me to, to fly out to wherever work? 
So I think that actually simplifies it a lot. It's a lot easier to wrap your head around like, okay, what do I actually think my hourly time is worth? And then you can go from there. And it's also a bigger marketplace. So there's multiple jobs and multiple docs and things are always kind of changing. So I think it is really a, a different approach when you're taking that short-term approach to negotiating. And when thinking about negotiating your salary, or if you're considering joining maybe a small group, when is it appropriate or is it to ask to look at financials? And do you recommend having somebody look at those with you? Like, let's say you don't have an MBA or you're not comfortable, you don't even know what you're looking at. Like, how do you think about that when you counsel new grads coming out as far as like what? Because it's one thing for someone to tell you, yeah, we're super financially stable. This is going to be great. Come on in versus like looking at, you know, what's really going on on the books. Yeah, right. I mean, so they should be willing to give their books pretty early and it usually should come from their accountant or their accounting firm. It'll require signing a non-disclosure agreement, which it shouldn't be an issue. But yeah, if, I would say if they're not disclosing those, that I view that as a red flag. But yeah, th that sh should be something that's be expected to be asked to see and understand when the partners are becoming partners, how much they're paying, and then all of those issues, how they're getting overhead allocated. And then as far as bringing in, like, who should you have help with that? Definitely, I think an attorney is great. Some attorneys, like the one you've had on, Michael Johnson, seem to have a really good understanding of both the kind of finances of it as well as kind of the nitty gritty of the contract. And so at a minimum, I would have, you know, an attorney that specializes in that area to kind of review it and to kind of give an easy overview. But really what you want to know is percentage of overhead you're going to be expecting and when and how much to become partner. I think those are like the most important items that I've seen. But yeah, those are great questions. How do you know when, let's say, timing, let's say you have joined a practice. So let's talk about like the mid-career physician or the physician now that he's been out in practice three to five years. And let's say you are at the same group or the same hospital. How do you know when to renegotiate or ask for a raise? Yeah, that's a great question. It's always easier to do it <laughs> before you join than during, right? Like, yeah, that's, that's, I think, probably one of the hardest things to do. I think that's why we see so much change anymore. From a hospital standpoint, I'll speak to that first because I know that pretty well. Those contracts all have a certain like kind of time frame to them, and they're usually up for renewal after two to three years or maybe five years. And then there's a period when they go off of a guarantee. So I think whenever there's going to be a change like that or a change is noted significantly, that's if you see one coming up, I think that's a good time. Usually, though, what happens is you come off your guarantee and the doc is expecting a certain salary to continue based on their understanding of how it's been calculated and they get something different. So if you don't foresee it coming up and then it hits you, I would kind of do it as soon as possible and make the meeting with the kind of highest up person that you can, unless you really want to deal with a lot of frustration of talking to this person who talks to this person, talks to this person. In a private practice, it's going to be a lot easier because you, usually there's a senior partner or a managing partner, depending on the size of the group or a CEO, depending on how big it is. But you're the physician in the group. You're the one You're the one doing the cases. And I mean, you have a right to get as high up the chain as you would like. So, I mean, I think the moment you start to be like, wait a second, this doesn't seem right. I think it makes sense to, to start at least trying to have those conversations. And I think that's really important is not to wait on it because it's just going to, the moment you make those conversations, the clock starts ticking with whoever the counterpart is. If you wait until you're getting really frustrated and asking questions of, you know, an office manager or this person who doesn't really know or just kind of pushes you off or ignores the email, it's going to get really frustrating. And so I've seen that happen a lot. And then that's hard to come back from sometimes. So if you like the job and you want to stay there, I think the sooner you have those higher up discussions as soon as possible, the better. Yeah. And have you had experience, you know, with situations where maybe you have a physician that's been in a role for a long time and hasn't really gotten a raise because they haven't asked for one? And so they just kind of continue at whatever salary they're at while their peers make more money? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that usually what I've seen has been more like an employee group that they try to keep it pretty equal with as far as like RVU pay. Like it's not like someone's making more per RVU than another, but I've certainly seen a situation where the whole group was underpaid and would not have gotten a raise if they didn't all ask for it, all kind of realize it's a problem. Yeah. So I think as far as an individual person where everybody else is making more than them, I have not run into that very often. I'm sure it happens, but usually if one doc in a, an employed group is dissatisfied, they all are. Certainly there are like with independent practices, I've seen situations where 
one partner is getting less overhead allocated or feeling like they're getting a better payer mix, right? So those type of squabbles happen all the time where, and I think I feel like in those situations, I see it a lot more actually in ortho than in ENT with my friends that are ortho docs. Everybody feels like the other person's making more than they should. So we're, I think, a little bit more chill at our specialty, but I think typically it's an issue where the whole group is getting undercompensated compared to where they probably should be or made to take more call than they otherwise should. And there's really power in the numbers, but what you typically have is maybe one partner who's kind of holding out because maybe they are golfing buddies with the CEO and they don't want to disrupt the good thing that they have going. So, but yeah, I think as a rule of thumb, if you're dissatisfied in your group, probably some other people are, or they don't even realize it, right? They don't realize that they're having this issue with how they're getting compensated, but I don't really see too much where it's like someone's making $20 an RVU and someone else is making 80, right? And that's too much in our specialty at least. Yeah, I think it can be challenging because we don't really talk about money. There's not a lot of transparency and it's very easy to just assume that everyone is kind of having the same or similar base salaries based on what stage of their the career that they're in. What if you're told that something is non-negotiable or if you're told, oh, we can't raise your salary by that much, like we're only allowed to raise it by this much per year, like that's just too big of a jump? Yeah, well, so that's a great question, Ashley. So nothing legal is non-negotiable, I think, is typically what I've found to be true. It really comes down to their motivation, their creativity, and their, and their basically their desire to continue to have the ENT or the doc on their team. The one thing with salary where you run into it being legal or not has to do with, as we talked about earlier, fair market value. But what you're describing sounds like it's just like a reasonable increase in salary to maybe to get on par with what everybody else is making or maybe, you know, where you feel like your productivity would lead. And that's totally reasonable. And hiding behind like a company policy or a hospital policy is a common tactic when you're kind of negotiating with somebody. So what I find is you know, very useful is to understand as best you can. Sometimes it requires a few meetings, right? You have to understand where they're like who the players are and the people across the table, like where are they coming from? Is this an actual policy? What pol- is this how this is how they've done things, right? Is this a written policy somewhere? If so, what are the when can that policy be changed and why? And then understanding kind of what you're bringing to the table what value you are, have an understanding for what your receipts have been. I mean, you should have access to know how much you've billed, how much you've, what your AR has been, what your accounts receivable has been, how much you've brought in for the hospital. When you're employed, especially knowing what overall value you've brought to the hospital as far as scans that you've ordered, cases that you've brought, I think those are all important things. So you can advocate for yourself to have an understanding of what you're actually bringing to the table. And then when they say it's non-negotiable, I mean, I I always, for me, I, I think that that's usually not true. If it's a legal thing you're asking for, it's just limited by their creativity and their desire to have you on board. And what I find though, I advise our docs never take it personally because we are becoming a commodity rather than a valued like asset. Physicians are viewed as, oh, well, whatever, I'll just get another one, right? Like that's not true in our field anymore. It is very difficult to recruit ENT. Um, So understanding that I think is important. An MP or a PA are great additions to our teams, help us extend our care to patients. But they're not going in and going to the OR and doing cases and managing tonsil bleeds and doing urgent trachs, right? So like we are a valuable asset to hospitals and we're not as easily replaced as I think sometimes administrators may think. But if something you're told something's non-negotiable, I always recommend having a plan B and knowing that, hey, it's hard to not take it personally, but usually it's not. It's usually kind of a misunderstanding from the other side thinking, oh, we'll just we'll just recruit in another one, no problem. Even though I think that's not always true. Sorry, I'm kind of a pessimist when it comes to negotiating these days. <laughs> no, I, I think that brings an important point of how we leverage experience that we come with or whether it's subspecialization or, hey, your experience, maybe you are five to 10 years out, 20 years out, and you have experience that that's something to leverage and to be able to kind of use to your benefit to show the value that you bring. Perhaps it's building a service line. Perhaps it's having built a large program or a practice. I think all those things are important and those aren't necessarily replaceable. And you can use that as well, right? In terms of bargaining chips. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're, we're not, often as physicians, we're not 
Allie struggles from this a lot, right? I mean, she's like the valedictorian of her med school class. She has a, a woman in otolaryngology and dad lectureship named after her. But like, she never, like, I was like, man, if I had a quarter of her talent, I would <laughs> be talking about that all the time, right? Most physicians are not good at, I think, self-promotion, right? It goes against the kind of altruistic way where we're really, I mean, think about just your training alone, like the sleepless nights, the hard work, the lack of pay, and this true like here of trying to make yourself better, trying to learn better, trying to care for patients. So we are not trained to self-promote, to be able to explain what our value is and why it deserves recognition or compensation to a level that's appropriate and fair. So that's exactly true. And so I think that's like, it's like anything you like, the more you do it, I think the easier it gets. I try to keep like a little especially certainly when I was right out of residency and employed, would try to keep a little list of like, yeah, things that I was kind of proud of that we had accomplished, right? Doing the, bringing the first this case or the first that case or patient feedback and thank you notes that have been received. Like, I think that all is important just to show, hey, this is the value that we bring beyond. I mean, hell, if you're bringing a ton of cases and your numbers are there, that's one thing, right? That usually speaks a lot. But if you have these other unique attributes that you bring, especially if you've had you know, like, oh, I started an amazing ENT podcast that is pretty much the best podcast out there, right? Like, so like all of those things like add together. Not to, paid, not paid yeah, to say. All yeah, right. <laughs> uh, we sell awesome <laughs> t-shirts and sweatshirts at our merch store. Like, yeah, like the, all those things can be used to help when you're having those meetings and trying to show your value, especially when there is a huge disconnect between what your compensation is and what you think it should be. So how do you do the dance? Meaning, how do you get comfortable talking about it, going back and forth? How do you know when you should stop and walk away or you take what they give you and what questions to ask? Am I asking too many questions? Am I asking the right questions or enough questions? So I've investigated or read a lot about negotiation starting back when I was starting our first contract negotiation. And there's been a lot of good material out there. There's a lot of there's a lot of good podcasts out there. There's a few good books. The one I really like and kind of like the the one that I think jives most well with me and I've had the most success with is there's this, he's a former FBI hostage negotiator. His name's Chris Voss. He runs something called the Black Swan Group and he has a book called Never Split the Difference, right? Yeah, I heard of it? Yeah, it's a great book. I, I mean, I think that is a resource that I would I would highly recommend. It doesn't all apply, but it in a lot of ways it does to what we're doing and even just tell when we're negotiating with our patients over like getting them to follow an LPR diet, right? I find that I've used a lot of those techniques. He has like actually 10 things that he uses. I use about four of them kind of almost daily now. So never split the difference. So basically the points that I have taken away from that are, you know, you want to understand the perspective and emotions and use what they what he calls tactical empathy, which is, it's not this idea that you're just kind of completely fake, but a little bit it is, right? You just want to make sure that you forcing yourself to kind of understand who I'm negotiating with, what do they value? What do they want? How desperate are they? What's their budget like? What's the morale of their partners? Like understanding these things is really important. And then labeling and identifying like negative emotions or issues they may have, right? An example of that would be now you've understood, you've done the background research, you know how well the ENT department has done, you know how big of a budget or shortfall your counterpart has in their thing. And so you think they can pay you more, right? You think there's plenty of room for an increase in an RVU or an increase in a salary. Well, then labeling what you think their negative emotions are towards you is, is a great idea. So for example, like, I know you think I'm an overpaid doctor. I, I know you think I should probably suck it up and just take more call like Dr. Smith used to, right? Like actually labeling those items I have found to be pretty helpful because otherwise it's this kind of weird unspoken tension. It's almost like naming the elephant in the room, but in a very collegial way. So labeling and identifying those emotions. As far as actual number, like if you think you should be paid something, never set the anchor is kind of the the idea. Never give a number if you can at all avoid it. And the more experienced the person you're negotiating with, the more likely you are going to be to give the number first. But that's a really key thing because if you're, let's say you think you're underpaid by $100,000 in your salary, you don't need to actually say that, right? You just say, I feel like here's the value that I'm bringing. I know you think I'm an overpaid doctor. I know you think I should be taking, should to be complaining about this or that, but here's the value that I'm bringing. Here's why I think I should have this an increase. How much would you morally like to get paid? That's a question to defer and avoid as much as possible. Let them bring it to you because then you've actually kind of set, you do not want to negotiate against yourself and it's extremely common and easy to do. You'd be surprised sometimes if you're setting the anchor, how much can be behind because if they hear like, oh, you know, I think 100K, like, great, we were thinking 250K more, right? Like you're really <laughs> underpaid. So that's an important one. How do you do that though, Mark? Like they throw the ball back and say, okay, well, what do you want? Like, how do you say, what do you want to give me? <laughs> 
come. <laughs> I love the show Meet the Press, right? I don't know if you've ever seen this. I started watching it years ago and the Meet the Press is, it was hosted by Chuck Todd until recently, but the whole show is they ask direct yes and no questions to congressmen, cabinet officials, right? All politicians of all sorts. And they never get a yes or no answer. It always gets deferred, right? So if I'm in that conversation and they say like, well, what do you want to be made? I'm like, you just defer it, right? You just like talk about your value. You go back to like, well, you know, I really would like you to take a look at the compensation and ensure that it's fair because I feel that it's not. I feel that I'm bringing this value A, B, C, and D. And I really think this is what I'm asking is appropriate. And I'd really appreciate you to talk to your CFO or whoever the people are and let me know what we can do to improve this because I think it's undervalued. And you can say, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know what, you know, I really am trusting your your good faith effort to do a, use the terms fair market value analysis to ensure that this is improved. What do you need in writing? You know, you, a lot of these nigga. <laughs> Everything. So what I found to be useful is to send a summary email at the end of a meeting. So it doesn't have to be in writing from them, right? You don't have to like be keeping notes and ask them to sign it right afterwards. Like we don't do anything like that, but like I will usually send an email afterwards and be like, hey, thanks for the meeting. You know, just to be clear, here's what we've discussed and here's my understanding of our conversation. So it's been at least a document and somewhat of a memo that they've seen. And then, you know, the rest of the stuff, one thing I learned in a contract law for, and not an attorney, but had a little bit of contract law in the MBA process is we always think, oh, you have to have something signed, like written down and signed for it to be in effect. And that's not true. Really, a contract is a meeting of the minds. And if something has been, like an understanding has been gotten to, you don't even necessarily need to sign it. Like they have there's something called the statute of frauds where you have to like, that's why you have to sign for your offers when you're making house purchases or offers. Those all have to be in writing, right? But in general, for a contract to be enforceable, I mean, it can be in the back of a napkin. It can be just an agreement, some showing that, hey, we we had a meeting of the minds. And so I like an email afterwards. And that at least kind of makes it clear going forward kind of what the understanding was. And then to your question earlier, one thing that I've also found to be useful is to ask questions, right? That's a really valuable negotiating tactic. Like, how am I supposed to miss every other weekend with my family? How am I supposed to provide the best care to patients when I'm up at 2 a.m. multiple times a week, right? How am I supposed to turn down these amazing offers I'm getting to go live in Evansville, Indiana to make this amount of money, right? Like, so like kind of asking questions is another really useful way when you're negotiating that almost kind of switches it. So it's not your problem, like in more kind of your counterparts, like you're kind of putting it on like, hey, help me out here. How am I supposed to do these things? How am I supposed to be accepting this salary that's so much less than everywhere else? And then I think a tone of voice is really important as well, like a radio voice, which you guys have. So you guys would be like ace that, right? It's like the kind of calm, clear, not like elevating up and down emotions or getting too excited or whatever, just like calm, clear tone of voice, I think is another really useful technique when you're having those conversations. So how do you calmly negotiate a non-compete? Yeah, non-competes. That is a hot button topic these days. And I have a little bit of split feelings about it because I do understand, especially depending on the specific community, the reason for non-competes. But I also think we have gone like completely way too far to the extreme. So there's been a lot of talk of them going away. So I think the most egregious example I've heard of was Jimmy John's apparently used to have a non-compete in their employment agreements so that their employees making, now they make probably a little bit more than minimum wage, but back in the day, minimum wage, weren't even allowed to go work at a subway, right? That's ridiculous, right? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. So I would, with non-compete clauses, those are going to be one of those things that to get it taken out completely, I think would be extremely difficult in a lot of situations, as long as they're legal and they may go away, they may not be legal much longer. But I think there's usually a lot, not a ton of sympathy for doctors in those situations. I think, I think if they're going to legislate it away, I mean, it's just my years of meet the press listing. You know, I get the sense that it's not going to go away for physicians because there's a lot of competing interests, especially among hospital associations and et cetera. But I have found a lot of success in rather than saying like, well, I'm not signing a non-compete to be kind of a little bit more reasonable about it. And I think you get a lot further. So for example, why don't you want to sign a non-compete, right? What are you concerned? If you don't work at this job, are you, do you think that you might do private practice, right? Do you think you'll like set up a shingle? Well, that shouldn't be any harm to them as a big hospital system for you to set up a solo private practice. Do you think you might join another group across town or like a little outside of town? Like what are the hospitals you're looking at? So I think having that understanding, if there is a way to not just like have it kill the deal, 
while having in your mind a really reasonable plan B that you'd want to do and make sure that's accounted for is reasonable. I've successfully like brought in for some like locum companies, like there'll be, you know, sometimes you get those cities that are right on the state and they have like the little dual state or tri-state areas. Like they will do like a 30 mile radius or counties that kind of spread out. And so cutting it off at state lines, I've had success with, especially when we have like clients nearby. So I think that you can try to get rid of it. If you think it's not that valuable to the counterpart that you're negotiating with, oftentimes they want to have it in there because what they're going to, it's going to be a lot easier for them to sell their contract to their CFO or their CEO if they're saying, hey, no, we have a non-compete. We just altered it a little bit as opposed to they refuse to sign a non-compete, right? That often might be a deal breaker which is fine if you can't do it, if it's like you're set there, you can't move from there and your only option would be to be jobless there or have to travel, then that might not be the job. But the other thing to know is we do have a lot of, I mean, we've had a lot of docs these past few years who have been working out in like long time non-compete, like a year or two years. And not to pump up like locums as an alternative very much, but it, it has been a really, especially some of the jobs that they've left. I mean, they had to stay there for their kids They've ended up making as much doing locums like part time as they, you know, or more than they did for working full time and taking a ton of calls. So keep that in mind. There are other options besides just having to be jobless in that community. It's not ideal. So that's why I'd say try to tweak it rather than actually cancel it would be the usually the option I recommend. As we round this out, thank you very much for taking the time to go through yeah, all of for this. Me. I go back to your comment about taking your own personal inventory of your values, because I think with every step that we talk about, it's like if you go back to that list of what's really important to you, I think that really helps give you perspective about what's worth fighting for, what's worth, you know, like give on this to kind of keep sacred what's important to you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's hard to like talk about negotiating as like a broad scale. I I think certain skills are, you know, valuable, tactical empathy, understanding the perspective of the other side, don't set the anchor, avoid compromise, because usually people aren't happy if they're each giving up something, right? That's fine in politics, but not when we're negotiating our careers. Label and ID their negative emotions, watch your tone of voice and ask questions to kind of make it their problem. I mean, those are useful things, but ultimately at the end of the day, everybody does have something that's important to them, right? Probably people have listened to me talk about my, you know, desire to hang out with our young children all the time and take them everywhere. And that's their nightmare, right? I like understand that. I get that. It's I know I have friends who are my age. They just love, I mean, they they're working 80 hours a week. They're taking call all the time. They love it. They love their job. That's great. That's just not everybody. And so If that is important to you, right, like you said, Ashley, like know what's your value, what's important to you, but then make sure you're getting in return from your counterpart the value that is deserved for that type of work ethic or, you know, whatever your specific interest or need is. Mark, thank you so much. for. Thanks, Kobe. Yeah, no. (laughs) For our listeners who want to check out Michael Johnson, episode 107, How Do I Negotiate My Physician Contract? There's a part one and part two that was hosted brilliantly by Dr. Varun Varadharajan, so please check it out. And of course, please check out episode 57 with Dr. Allison Royer on her experience in building entlocums.com and ENT Surgery Solutions to learn more about the locums opportunities. And thank you again for coming on. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ashley. Thanks, Agopi. Appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer, Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.